Ruby Wax is a comic writer and performer who has lately become known as a campaigner on mental health issues and a champion of mindfulness. Born in Illinois, the only child of refugees, Ruby studied psychology at Berkeley. Did I say that right? Berkeley. Yeah. Berkeley. Berkeley. And- Berkeley. Berkeley yeah. and moved to Britain in 1977 where she wrote for shows such as Not the Nine O'Clock News, Girls on Top with Dawn French and Jennifer Saunder, uh, Saunders and Tracy Ullman. In 2012 she completed a master's degree in mindfulness based on cognitive therapy at Oxford and in 2014 was appointed an OBE for services to mental health. Imagine that. Her recent books include the number one bestseller Sane New World, Taming the Mind and A Mindfulness Guide for the Frazzled. Her new book, How to Be Human, The Manual, is released in January. She's been married since 1988 to her third husband and has three children. Thanks for coming yeah, on. You could, I could have just listened to you all day thinking I'd like to meet that one. She sounds like a yeah. terrific human She's being. She's a bore, man. Yeah, she needs that much kudos. <laughs> so, Ruby, how, what is it that made you transition from an, an entertainment-based life to one based on I don't, the psychology, the spirit, therapy, whatever this is that you're doing now? What's, what in, inspired you? Well, I, uh, I went to Berkeley when I was young. That's how you say it. Berkeley. Uh, Berkeley. And I never finished because I hitchhiked through Europe. I decided. Mm. What, were you, do- what were you doing in the first place at Berkeley? I was doing psychology, oh, wow. but I never finished. And I just ended up hitchhiking one day. And I have nightmares to this day what my locker combination is because I left all my books there. So to this day, I'm still racking out my brains. They're, I am under the illusion they're still there. So I wanted to come to uh, Europe to get away from my parents, A. And B, I wanted to, this is pathetic, a classical actress with no talent, none, zilch. The, I mean, since high school, there was like 6,000 people in my school. Mm. I was the only one not in the show. 6,000 were in Hello, Dolly. I sat, I mean, I it was. It been quite a production. It was and a, a big, small audience. <laughs> <laughs> View staring at five thousand nine hundred ninety-nine people. Put me in, hello, Dolly. Anyway, fuck them all. Can you say that? Yes. Like my whole life has been, you know, where are they now? Mm. And I've tracked them. Vengeance against the, Berkeley. No, against Evanston Township place. High School. That, and then I went to Berkeley to study psychology. And then mm. I thought I'm going to come to England and become a classical actress. <laughs> if you knew how delusional that was. So I used to watch Girls on Top. I liked it. You were in that it, was as much well as later writing. on. That was much later oh, on. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. No, Evanston was when I was like 17. Mm. Then Berkeley was 18, 19. And then Girls on Top? Girls on Top, way later. How though? How oh, long? way, like a, a century? No, about, um, I was 17. You were in your Girls 20s. on Top, I was, no, I was 30. Right. Yeah, there was kind of a gap. So you knew when you were in early life and academia that you were interested in psychology then it seems like you pursued some external glamorous goal and then in middle years but that's the age isn't it you're divided between uh food for the brain which isn't really on your agenda when you're 20 and yet uh narcissism was always nagging away i mean now that i know how my father got out of europe i understand why i have this insatiable thirst for things that are impossible Mm. You know, because they said he'll never get out. And now I have this drive to get things that people say it's impossible. Mm. I I had no English accent. I had no talent. That's a tough one. So I went to Europe. I just hitchhiked. I I sort of sold some marijuana to get the plane ticket. Can I say that? Yes. None of these will be handed to the authorities, Ruby. (laughs) I've not got an agenda to derail you. Well, I was in Berkeley. So they had. Anyway, I sold that and some Girl Scout cookies, got to Europe, found myself an acting teacher. Finally, it, it's a longer story. Um, um, I hitchhiked with somebody from the cast of Hair. This is sort of sad because that was my first taste of bohemia, you know, anarchism. Mm. And uh, that is what you feel that it is somewhat telling that it was a prepackaged and staged version of bohemia that you alloyed yourself to. Well, I was, yeah, I stalked him. So then um, I went with this guy through Europe and uh, ended up in. It's Israel, where I found somebody to teach me acting. Then I came back to London, lived in a bedsit for two years, and auditioned for probably Rada seven times, yeah. and was rejected each time because it was. They said one of the most grotesque auditions they'd ever seen. So you had a ferocious drive for success and for attention. I read um, saying New World. There was a bit in there where you talked about being like a, a like you know. So we know where fame sort of 
can lead to. It, either it's a continued upward trajectory or it can become sort of grimly cataclysmic. And you know, your anecdote about that Shark Tank show that you were a participant in, <laughs> yeah. saying that, you know, that there was a sort of an attractive woman who was in bikinis who was the sort of central focus of Celebrity Shark Tank or whatever it was, or Shark Cage. Celebrity Shark Bait. Shark Bait. That, was, that, marked, the end of my, <laughs> that marked the end of my career, so I like to pick that scab. Like to yeah. pick it a lot, yeah. And that, so it was. That all... was when it was already my career was really fading away. You mm. know, there's signs because you ride on that surf and people give you attention and you get you know the, the, it in, infanta, infantilizes you. This kind of career, you know, that's why you can't get. You know, it's so hard to wean off the mother breast of fame. Mm. And so um, then the you know I started getting desperate as they take the you know nipple away. And said, oh, I'll do anything. Please document my gallbladder operation. So they said, here's something even worse. Get in a shark tank with Richard E. Grant and we'll film it. Right. And it marked the end of my career. It's peculiar, actually, because like both you and Richard E. Grant are, I would say, very, very talented, bright, brilliant people. But the machinery of celebrity will ultimately deposit you in a, in shark, a shark tank. tank. So uh, what was it, uh, you know, other than the obvious, that particular, <laughs> was particularly revealing about that? What, how, what was the nature of that revelation? Of knowing that we were uh, Did you being think, thrown like, oh, to the no, sharks? no, it's over. This is we it. We kind of knew it's over, but in the first few years of being ejected from the uh, central you know, the central spotlight is you think, oh, well, this is just temporary. (laughs) Surely they'll have me back. But there's telltale signs like when I was asked to cut the ribbon at Costco's for the uh, Costa Coffee Mm. at Terminal 3. That's another sign that things aren't going well. So Richard and I were joking, saying how awful the show was and really it would end our careers. And then it did it. It did kind of end around then. And they had a really beautiful babe from Holyoaks, you know, who was asked to take her top off to practice getting into a shark tank. So they'd say to Richard and I, you aren't needed. And most days we weren't needed. So Richard and I both bought houses in Cape Town, which I still have. Wow. Because we were so bored and the rand was really bad. So you could buy one for about 10 pounds. So Richard and I went with a camera following us because they always like to pretend, oh, this is reality. Mm. We both bought houses. And on day 75, the babe with the breasts had like refused to get in the sh- with the sharks. They had been every day training her, right, making her stand in a frozen, um, a, fr- a freezer to check that she could take the cold, right, with no top on. Imagine, and mm. she'd say, "Do you think I'm being exploited?" To us, we go, "No." Uh, anyway, the last day she refused to get in the water, so they said, "Get the old ones in here." Richard and I are now crammed into <laughs> these rubber things. I'm actually. Um, I've actually got cystitis. I don't know if you could say that, but that's not a good you know, thing to go in a shark tank with. So they drop us in, and we're not in a tank, not in a cage like they usually do for a special occasion. They put us in a tube, a see-through tube, wow. which means you're in the aquarium and the shark's watching. And he's magnified. So he comes at us. <laughs> I pissed myself so that urine came out of my collar. And then Richard and I started laughing beyond – and they – they dubbed in screams, so it ends with, it looks like Richard and I are sitting in the bottom of a test tube. And I always say, um, the sharks just swam by looking for A-list celebrities. Mm-hmm. Anyway, that was pretty Sounds much bloody it. brilliant, actually. <laughs> I it. know, it does sound good now, but they cut a lot out. Mm. So it was just basically tits, 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 Richard and I screaming and some urine coming and out. And urine coming out of the neck, which yeah. is an incredible image. But like, so obviously, <laughs> though, whilst you tell the story <laughs> in a, a very humorous way. Yeah, it's, it's painful. Agonizing. So, what happened to you mentally and spiritually that made you want to stop? Well, uh, you know, I'm not participating I, yeah. in celebrity. You know, you, I had a lot more life before, and nothing sadder than an old celebrity. Nothing. You know, it yeah. used to be Panto was the pits. Now it's one of those reality shows where you eat a cockroach. So I thought this ain't happening. You know, and people saying, "Weren't you?" And I go, "Was I who?" You know, it was never me anyway. So I thought, jump now. Jump before the party party's over, you know, mm. before, you know, before you're not invited anymore. So I, I jumped right out and went to school to get a degree in psychotherapy, which was um, people, let, you know, dropped me and laughed and said, oh, a psychotherapist. But I just needed something. I knew I wasn't going to be a psychotherapist. But, you know, it got me a new group of friends. I had to wean myself like coming off of drugs off, you know, c- getting on the tube and nobody going, oh, fuck, I know who you are. Now I go, do you know who I am? And they go, fuck no. Buy a ticket like everybody else. You know that one. The arrogance had to be squeezed out like sweat. 
And then eventually I had my new friends. I went, I studied, you know, Jung, and then I'd study Winnicott, and then I'd studied Bowlby, and I got really, you know, I thought this is great. What? Tell me about it. Did it feel like you were picking up something that you had discarded? My brain started getting uh, honed again. You know, it started to come to life. Uh-huh. And then, um, and then I had a, then I had the serious breakdown in the, in my third year. That's when everything crumbled. And I think it like before you invent reinvent yourself, there has to be a death. I always yeah. think of the phoenix. You know, before he rises, it was death. You know that it, everything shuts down. All your everything that was your reality is taken away. There's just nothing. Mm. And then some of us, and I always love this expression. This is where you either turn into wine or vinegar, which coincidentally Jung did say. So I started to. Um, I've, I was in that institution a long time. Were you institutionalized? Yeah, and it was so bad that I. Oh, this is tragic. At one point, the BBC threw me another bone. And I did a show for, uh, it was a BBC um, internet, right? Mm-hmm. Not like it is sure. now sexy. It was like a, a show called Ruby's Room or something that three people would hear. It was about mental illness. Yeah. So uh, every week, um, three a, a person would come to my house. That was the idea with a different pathology. So I'd have schizophrenics or um, physical dysmorphia or bipolar. And then I'd take them in and we'd have tea and they'd sit with my cat and my kids would come in and... And then I, because I knew how to interview them because they're my people, then at the very end it would say, here's the symptoms and here's what you can do about it, which I thought was really responsible. And the show was sometimes hilarious. By this time I was, I couldn't get on TV, but that was a great show, even if you cut me out. So again, I don't want to get bitter because it was a blessing that I got kicked out now. Um, And they'd come over every week. And this is how bad it was. When I first got the job, my first guest was a depressive and I, I had 10 shows to go. So I was in the institution. Ed had to get me, pick me up from Ed's the your inst- husband. Yeah, pick me up from the institution. I pretend, I put lipstick on. Everybody in the institution applauded and said that was so brave. Imagine, you know, that's from the cream of the crop. I went home. I'm sitting with a depressive, and I'm from an institution, dripping. You know, that's a, dripping in sweat and trying to pretend you were who you used to be. And the depressed person is looking at me, going, "Man, you are more fucked than I am." Of course, nobody can see when you're mentally ill. So I did, shaking slightly, but they think, oh, she's being funny, finished the interview, and then was taken back to the institution. It's my first show. Clinically, what uh, type of mental illness were you suffering from then? The same I I will always have. It's clinical depression. Depression. I don't get the up. I don't. It's vanilla depression. It's not the up and the down. Huh. So that was a long time in there. I tried to, I, at Regents, they said, you have to leave because you're not finishing. So everything was taken. And then gradually when I came out, and that was a bad time. You know, I'd sit for weeks on end in a chair. Did you ever get this? Where you'd look at the shower and think, oh, man, I, someday I hope I can get into that again. Because it's, it, it's not feasible that you could ever take a shower. It's, it's, it's too confusing. Mm. So the nurse would come and hold my hand. And then she'd finally take me to the shower after a month. And then eventually she got me to the door. And then eventually she took me to the park. And so I was saved. So you were experiencing deep, deep despair. And that despair feels like a sort of an absence of any anything life force, any energy. What have you learned about psychology or in neurology that is helpful to you in understanding your own personal experience with regard to its in extremis? Yeah. Well, f- to study the brain is such a relief to understand the, psych- you know, the, the pathology of it because then you think it's not my imagination because in everybody lurks this feeling that they're making it up. Come on, Mike, Ruby. Oh. Will you? Uh, everybody thinks they're making it up. Mm. I mean, it, that, that's that's so the disease isn't necessarily depression; it's shame. That's what we all suffer from. The, yes. it, it's it's like saying to somebody with Alzheimer's, "Oh, come on, you remember where the key is? <laughs> come on, <laughs> try up. harder. Uh, just think. It's on the cabinet, you stop. stupid cow. <laughs> <laughs> okay, where is it now? I've hidden it again. Oh, please do. No, I'm no. exhausted. I've swallowed it. Okay, uh-huh. where is it now? Oh. 
in your tummy. <laughs> well, that, that is cruel. So, like, to, to understand it neurologically, and so mechanically, neurologically, was a it's the same thing as that's. It's a brain disease. I find it even as a person that sort of personally knows about mental illness and knows a lot of people with it. I still sort of do find mental illness annoying. Because I hate the name. Mm, okay, because cool. your brain is an organ. Do you know what I mean? If you flipped yourself upside down, would you call your feet mental f- foot illness? It's a. Do you know what I'm saying? Oh, you look physically well. What the fuck does it mean? Mental mental is physical. It's an it's an organ. It's the only one that when it breaks down, you don't get any sympathy cards, and mm. yet it runs everything. So the ignorance of the world is astonishing. To why me. do you imagine, or, or why do you think that is? Uh, I, um. There's always been a stigma, so I'm, you know, there's always been women at 55 lose their jobs. I'm not naive, you know. I, I'm not one that goes, it's not fair. It was always a taboo, you know, if, because people maybe think there by the grace of God go I. You know, it's only a hundred years ago. I think we were burned at the stake. So it, but it will leave. You know, the gay movement suddenly now homosexuals are everywhere. In a minute, the whole gay thing will change again. It'll be that'll be the last taboo. But where we are now is still in an era of shame. Hmm. And I'm not, you know, I'm not, Typically, it's not fair. That's the way it is. If you were to examine the template of uh, bigotry against uh, sort of, uh, in inverted commas, minority social groups such as homosexuals, it's because of the sort of the casting of a, the dominant class's shadow into those groups. You like sort of talking about James Baldwin's analysis of the category of Negro is because it uh, it bears the shadow of the white dominant class. So if it is, if in terms of a template, shadow, it, it does follow the, that idea that it's a maligned and outcast group and it's not something that's essential. Because when I think about mental illness, I think, well, perhaps it's because if perception itself is warped, you can't. There's nothing that you can trust. There's nothing tangible there. And when a human being looks the same as they always yeah. look, but they're behaving differently, I find it very, very, I, I find it frightening when other people are sort of, you know, exhibiting mental illness. Um, but from a sort of, from a... Just because it's not tangible. And yet, they, yeah. you know, my professor said, I'm not bitching again, had uh, Bill Gates put the money into mental health, Instead of malaria, we would know what it is. You would be able to define depression just the way you can now define cancer. And that's only because it had a lot of money thrown at it, not because it's some mystical, you know, um, ethereal disease. It's just that nobody threw the money in. It's as simple as that. So you think no matter how a seemingly ethereal something might be, it is on some level mechanical. On like whether it's consciousness. At some no, point. no. Let's not put consciousness. A di- a dis- oh, we're going to continue. I'm gonna yeah, that's it. just fifteen minutes. Every fifteen minutes, Gareth will tell okay. me. Okay. Um, so yeah. I said about consciousness, yeah. but the For, mechanics put, of consciousness. No, no. Let consciousness is a whole other ballpark. Oh. But disease, you know, the way we can look and see how cancer is formed. Sure. It wasn't possible, you know, a thousand years ago. There has been now it is. In Everything ecology. is. A, it's a disease. That's mechanical. Uh-huh. Consciousness is a whole different ballpark. Oh, oh but yeah. consciousness, the relationship between consciousness and presumably the brain is integral. Uh, certainly, the, the but relationship the brain between hasn't consciousness got the capacity and the mind to understand. The brain can understand disease. Yes, the, it's a you know it's a technical glitch, but it can't. The, the consciousness is what the hell is that? Yeah, we just don't know. But like, but is there? But given the perspective and consciousness are possibly synonymous then the understanding of mental illness and consciousness are, I think, integrated. Like the, there is a relationship between mental illness and the nature of a person's consciousness because it's your consciousness that is becoming warped, isn't it? At least that's what's manifestly happening. Well, we don't know what consciousness is. I mean, I, Lewis Walpert says, um, sadness is to depression what a tumor is to cancer, meaning that's... Do you understand? It is something. There's something physiologically Sadness. not. Mm. It's, it's like not. A it's, tumor. it's it's a tumor. That's mm. that's what it is. Consciousness is a much bigger ballpark. Mm. It, it um, I know what you mean is that if you have a malignancy in your in your brain, obviously it's going to affect your thinking. But you know there are people. If you know, I love um, the man who thought his wife was a hat. You know mm. all those extreme things that I think I even put in my book. People who assume that their arms are real. You know, are, are the are their enemy, and so what's that illness? I have it written down. They chop their limbs off. Mm. Other people, you know, see their mother, and they see it 
that she's a stranger or they see their left hand and it looks like it's trying to kill them. Those are brain diseases. Mm -hmm. You know, they can easily be marked as to what's missing, what's there. Consciousness is, uh, of course, it 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 it, um, it inflicts itself on how the person thinks, of course, but they're still conscious. They still, yes. the moment they wake up in the morning. However, you know, the way we express ourselves is a teeny, teeny grain of sand on, uh, you know, an iceberg the size of Mars. So how you think and how you talk has nothing to do with, con- you know, it's a teeny bit of consciousness. Because consciousness is everything. You know, it's your heart rushing through. It's proteins being made. It's, we don't even know. You know, get, get somebody who's in physics in here and I'm, I'm at his feet. With the relationship between wellness, mental wellness, and mindfulness that you've been exploring really in all three of these books, it seems to me that it's using tools that have been available for a long, long time, millennia, uh, (laughs) primarily through uh, theological means, uh, um, and and, uh, these are predicated mostly on the idea of cleansing the consciousness, having a relationship with an aspect of yourself that's not mechanical, that is not the body, is not the brain. So what, 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 given that your latest book is A Monk and a Neuroscientist yeah. and you exploring mindfulness, exploring well-being, exploring well, being a human being. Yeah, it's not. The monk is obviously from the mindfulness school. The neuroscientist is very much um, how how what addiction is how the future works uh what how evolution you know affected us that you know how we actually do evolve um how how relationships are formed he comes from the very mechanical side and the other one is the mind and mm. both of them are married they completely agree on every front so that's to me really reassuring also they're funny mm. they have a good sense of humor um but it, to take mindfulness mindfulness was made sim- simple simply for the west by John Kabat-Zinn, who was dealing with people in pain. It wasn't for any mystical experience. And then my professor, Mark Williams, started to use mindfulness for psychological reasons, you know, for people with depression. So they're using some ancient wisdom, as yes. Jung did too. Everybody yes. borrows. And they put it all, you know, in using MRI scanning, which is only, I don't know, it's not that old. And they obviously did a lot of research. And it was mindfulness that had the best results. It wasn't like somebody showed up with a bindi oh. and decided, I'm going to push this one because, you know, there's a market in it. They literally did experiments on the works. And cognitive and mindfulness had the best results. But that do you, doesn't mean for everybody. I mean, it? no, what's good for me is going to kill you. Do you know what I mean? They say jogging is good. Well, the guy, got, the guy dropped dead who invented it. Mm. So we, part of mindfulness is understanding where's your tipping point, how much... You know, how much is good for you and when does it tip into sickness? When is it a habit? When does it go into addiction? When am I working in my flow and when have I tipped and now I'm going to burn out my immune system? Mm. That's what mindfulness is good for is that you can check your internal temperature. I can't get into the Buddhist stuff. Tell us what uh, mindfulness in your understanding of it and how you practice it means just for, you know, people Um, listening to this. Well, I don't do the woo-woo stuff, you know. Mm. that, That was not my, you know, what was appealing. Uh, I could give you the scientific reason, which really turns me on. Or just on. how to do it. Oh, how to do it is, but I like what happens in your brain when you do do it. Because if I explain to sit up and say, well, you lie down and then you get up. And then you lie down and you get up. I've got to show you my six pack for you to actually go, oh, I get it. So if I say, this is what you do, you sit down. I have to explain what the effects are in your brain. Uh-huh. So when you sit and you have a focus, when you take your mind to focus... Let me just, should I do my spiel? Yeah. Okay. Usually spiel. we're in a high state of anxiety. That's the culture we've created. You know, 50 years ago it wasn't so bad. Now distraction is our middle name. So that means there's a part of our brain that's primitive called the amygdala, and it's aroused when we feel threatened, and that's what sends the cortisol out, okay? We used it with dinosaurs, whoever the enemy was. As soon as the incident was over, we got calm again, Okay. The problem is it never shuts down, and that's why we're, so many people are burning out. Kids are cutting. That's the situation is that we're flowing cortisol the whole time. That's all it is, and it leads to every problem we have, physical ones too. So stop thinking mental. Too much cortisol burns, you know, causes cancer, diabetes too, infertility, obesity. All the problems are because of the cortisol. But if you start to focus 
and one of your senses. You could say because of the cortisol, or you could say because of the conditions that create cortisol. Like the cortisol is, uh, you know, what's happening if, on one level. But like also, it's like you know, what really needs to change the conditions that create the cortisol. conditions that create it. But because we aren't really thinking, you know, not anymore, we're more at the mercy of technology. Yeah. Nobody's, everybody's going, oh, let's shut technology down. Well, we put it there. That mm. is our evolution. You yes. know, we used to um, evolve to adapt to climate. Now we adapt to culture. It yeah. is our culture. But we don't have the genetic variants to deal with it. So now they're having to bring in things like mindfulness, and they'll be, in a few years, there'll be mental Fitbits, I'll bet you, to be able to test your own cortisol. Because left to our own devices in this world, addiction's out the window. You know, I mean, at its height. Yes. Obesity, the whole thing. I mean, we know what the situation is. But the result is you gush cortisol. So the thing with mindfulness, when you focus on a sense, just go with me on this, the, um, immediately there are, you're not thinking anymore. You're focused on a sense. So the amygdala goes, deactivates, and this other part called the insula, I'm making it simple, mm -hmm. activates. Okay, Each time you do an exercise where you watch your mind gabbling, then you focus on a sense. It deactivates, the other one activates. And the more you do it, just like a sit-up, that insula gets buff like a muscle so that when the shit hits the fan and you get really stressed, it's easier to pull to a focus because you've got, you know, you've done the workout. And then the, that, the, those voices going, this is shit, I'm an asshole, why am I depressed, nobody else is depressed, it's quieter. What sense do you use? I usually follow my breathing. Mm. And the thing is, it's portable. So I don't have to sit on a gluten-free cushion. If I'm on the, in the taxi here, I'm, you know... Rather than, see, they've actually said, that obviously, they do scans on people mind-wandering. It turns out that mind-wandering makes us really miserable. Mm. And also, you're, le you're, you're uh, missing three-fourths of your life. You can't, you can't and, and ordinarily, uh, out of five thoughts, four are negative. That's just human, our proclivity as humans. Mm. And again, it was for a good reason, because if we didn't think negatively, we would have been eaten. So we always have to be on our toes. Anyway, the thing with mindfulness is eventually you, you get Better this... Better to assume it's a lion and not a bush. Better not to sing a Disney tune because chances are you wouldn't be here in the evolution stakes these days. Yes. Yeah. How does... So I can see how that works. Anyway, I'm jumping around, but the point is, is that I'm, I can lose my temper like anybody and rage is still my drug of choice. But the, I can get the cortisol down quicker. So it doesn't give me the heart attack. How does it work in practice then? So I'll get, I'll get up in the morning, and to me it's a new habit like brushing my teeth. I, it, I try to do it at home, but all I do is track my breathing. That doesn't mean there's no thoughts. People get this wrong. The only time there's no thoughts is when you're dead. That's it. So you watch the shit coming through. You know, the, you're an idiot. Everybody, oh, God, I got on Russell Brand. He's such a genius. I'm such a moron. Why did I even Very do this? Very sensible I didn't thoughts, write this show. My God, I'm bluffing. Everybody's going to get caught. You know, the usual. Oh, don't forget to get a toaster. The toaster has to, got to be fixed. And you need more Q-tips. Don't go on Russell's show. Get some Q-tips. Was why wasn't I a ballerina? What did my mother do? Okay, this could go on forever. So they're going. But because I'm used to watching them, you know, I, I, I'm used to watching. They're more like a radio in another room. I sort of expect them and go, oh, yeah, that's track number 42. There's track number 77. Of course, you admire Russell. That doesn't mean you're an idiot. Just let it go Very through. Sensible, let it go through. Yeah, but natural, you are still a little bit of an idiot. Reaction. And he's looking at you like you're, you know what I mean, all that. So I sort of, the minute you can watch your thoughts, you're not slave to them. And some will be true. Maybe you don't like me. But the point is I didn't waste my energy thinking about it. If you're an asshole, that, then I'm an asshole. Do you know what I mean? Whereas before, and this is where the cognitive thinking comes in, you get caught in a habit. I really thought I was the stooge, that everybody thought I was an idiot. And I can blame it on my parents. You can blame it on whatever. You want to go on and on about it? Life is short. Mm. So instead of that, when I get my normal records, I can kind of, if you go to a, if the minute you go to a sense, the thinking lowers. So you could listen to you your listen. breath, or you could, or you could, like, you could focus on something. So you could use any sensory information. You could use listening that to sound. Redesignates attention. Yeah. Arabs use those beads. You know, if you if you focus on the sense of the beads, it's a very smart thing. If you're, that means that there's part of your body that's not involved in the thinking. It's you know so. The th of course, the thinking comes through, but you're 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 laying back a little bit, so you're going, oh, I see what I'm thinking. It's not necessarily true. Now let's rethink. Maybe Russell actually likes you. 
Let's just break well, the he habit. He adores you. He adores me. Now, what interests me is how many of these, many, this particular technique, mindfulness, is found in theology. Now, like, I'm sort of aware, like anybody, that there is much in uh, religion and scripture that is sort of of its time and is used to underwrite bigotry, power, and establishment. But what I, what, when I become fascinated is when in theology there are techniques that are effective uh, in helping us to moderate, control our consciousness and improve our lives, which they cannot possibly have had access to, the, which could, in their case can't have been underwritten by the technology mm. that it is currently being uh, I- examined with. So I think, how do they know in the Vedas that this is going to work? How do they know? I don't know. It's but fascinating, though, huh? I know. They that, knew. That they knew, but they were, uh, you know... Uh, Somebody went bingo. But the thing is, they've also put nuns in a scanner. And the very fact that they pray also lowers the amygdala. Amazing. So, um, That's where 30 minutes. It, so there are, you know, there are techniques. You if, mustn't worry. Watch that oh, racing tripping, mind tripping. of yours. Some are you Q-tips. feeling okay? Can I get some Q-tips? You can get Q-tips. You want me Before to I go send on the some train. to you? I'll it'll get be, some. I've got two when I get Q-tips at my house. gone, it'll be moisturizer. Don't you worry. There'll be something to replace the Q-tips. So there's an, a, a constant morphing need in your consciousness. I have this too. This thing you say about three quarters of your time, this is that my inability to be present, particularly in pleasant situations, really troubles me. I've, I, am a, a, I need intensity mm. in my life. You know, I, had a, I recently had an experience where I hung out with two men that I didn't know well, separate occasions, but on the same day. The first part of the day, very sort of a light-hearted, lovely occasion. And I sort of thought, why are you not fully present for this? Why are you observing this? Later on in the day, I was in a situation that was quite intense, but I was there. You know, I felt sort of somewhat threatened, not entirely safe, but I was very, very present. Something in my makeup means that I pay more attention when I'm no, when no, I don't feel that's, safe. See, that's uh, only because the neuroscientist was so hip on this stuff. Go on. Um, I would ask questions of the monk and the neuroscientist, and this is something he. He did, and it makes me feel better that you're not the only one. If we, um, it, whenever we're focused on anger or you know the negatives, uh-huh. that's sort of, uh, in a way, us at our best. You know, we were built for danger. Mm. So with this kind of, uh, when there's nothing to think about, we really like it. We're like you said in your book, we're all addicts to something. You know, it's now it's a lot of thought. You know, oh, I think I have to have sex. I think I have to have Q-tips. I think I have to. It's just the chase. The chase is much easier when there's something fearful or you're up against the wall. It's just like a, an, a, the animal lurks within us. So you think there's almost like a chemical stream that's internally moving that we subsequently narrativize. But we're like, that's why once the Q-tips are achieved, the moisturizer be, will be required there's because no question. the chemical yeah, impulse because, continues. And what's so interesting is that we feel the emotion first. Like I'll feel the drive and they put scanners on people. I'll feel it and then two seconds later I'll think it. So your thoughts are the last to know yeah. in a way. So if you're driven, let's say you're in the ad- addiction of anger, right? It'll kick in. You'll look for people. You'll make excuses it's like saying, oh, yeah, I'll give up smoking tomorrow. Oh, yeah, sure. I don't have to eat, but I think I will eat. Your brain mm. will outsmart you every time. Yeah. But it's your insides that get the urge first. I sort of said in the book it was like a hive of bees and the queen is sitting there. She, and she suddenly wants, let's say, a Starbucks. She thinks because she wants it, you're going to get a Starbucks. But there's a zillion worker bees and slave bees and valet parking bees. They're already buzzing with each other. And whoever buzzes the loudest has made the decision to get the latte. Then the queen thinks, oh, yeah, that's what I wanted. There's been a vote in Mm. every cell in your body before you actually kick into something. And And the juice of anger and rage is so much more addictive. Nobody ever gets addicted to kale. Mm. Yes, you know, I'm really trying to create that addiction. Don't you won't drinking the stuff by the gallon? Still don't like it. No, I once I thought you know I oh juice is good for you, so I made a big thing of it and I went on the train and drank it. I, the next day I spent my day vomiting, and they then I figured out I had drunk the equivalent of four football fields because <laughs> it's all smooshed up. Four football fields I had put in my body. You're drinking acres of the stuff, Ruby. <laughs> I don't. So this um. Uh, so the understanding consciousness from a mechanical perspective, uh, e. that's not conscious. Hive, no. uh, the mind, the mind. All right. So, like, people in academia are so particular no, about no, the I'm lingo. Not... Uh, like, it, like, my point is this: that uh, 
if you have a mechanical understanding, as expressed through that analogy around the hive mind and aspects of it, think you know the sort of the essential self being the queen bee and different aspects of the mind being different, you know, different bees within it. Like, but what, the bees are the consciousness, and we only know about the queen. So when yeah. you say consciousness, we have no idea. Except, of course, many of the uh, tech, the techniques that I am interested in, which incidentally are sourced from the same place as mindfulness, just another aspect mm-hmm. of it. They say that we can attune ourselves to an aspect of consciousness that is fr- is truly witnessing all else. And they say, well, how could it be? Because you are remembering it. Yeah. So, you know, it is you. But my experience of my experience of meditation is that it's only retrospectively that I go oh yeah wow i wasn't in that moment i will just then that's already happened i wasn't thinking and cataloging what went on for one minute or a second or for five minutes who knows because but my understanding see, of time yeah has been removed subsequently i narrativize it and go oh that was what was happening so like it's yeah, having i'm having a different relationship with in those moments i'm not thinking uh you know i want to have sex or i'm not good enough or mm. this might i'm afraid of this or i desire that there is a cessation in that so that's a for me that's a an, another aspect of meditation that's important which i think can change our relationship in a more uh, a more total way or a more extreme way than ju- just using it as a technique to calm yeah. down which i think is bloody valuable of N- course. yeah no it, it is and you're completely right i get very excited about the mechanics that, but that's my problem you know mm. the monk will say oh get off it come on it is it is a a practice of spirituality, and I have an allergy to that. But why? Uh, because I, you know, I grew up at the time where I was rebirthed, and then somebody shoved a crystal up my ass, and then you know, somebody... plus religious persecution drove your family from. Oh yeah, that might be it. Yeah, I didn't even think of that. So if I can't see it or I can't smell it, I don't buy it. But of course, the point of mindfulness is a, and I have a hard time saying it, to develop. I I always call it the C word, compassion, which yeah. now I talk about in the book, and presence. Those are also the point of it. But you see, yeah. my proclivities always go to the sure. like. Daddy won't think I'm smart unless I know the you know the physiology of it. Daddy will think it's another kooky stuff. Which oh, I've just had a revelation. We must kill Daddy. No, but I Daddy ne- must die. I didn't Daddy realize. Daddy is killing us. I didn't realize you. This is like eight thousand years of shrinkage you just did. It's the reason probably I'm holding on to the science is because my dad said everything I did was kook stuff. It's not this just cool your dad, stuff. though, Ruby. This is it's all our father. The patriarchy mm. itself is built on materialism and mechanistic thinking, precisely because it can be commodified and sold. And as soon as we begin to access aspects of consciousness or self that are beyond mechanistic and materialistic thinking, we begin to hmm, di- divulge, understand, access realms where our role here is no longer the role of the consumer, the civilian, mm. the citizen, but something quite different. And the thing that fascinates me about your work, I, I think that well, what I think you're doing beautifully and co- what cannot be disputed is you're making it accessible to uh, pe- and people need, like like you, people need to understand it in terms of material and mechanics and, and patriarchy. And uh, if that gets people to understand it, that's brilliant. But, where, but what I am fascinated in and by is how... Were people accessing this information without any mm. of these talks? And what else is there? Because I think your monk friend is right. It is about compassion. It is about presence. People have been talking about it for millennia, knowing that our salvation is in that direction. And the father, I don't think, is solely and uniquely external. But the father, like you have just expressed, we carry with us. It becomes all of our father, both inner mm. and outer. And it prevents us from exploring neurological circuitry, which might give us, you know, a sane new world, to quote your title wow. back at you. You should write a book. Well, I'm, I've got a pen. I've made the first tentative steps <laughs> yes, into a career God, in literature. That's a brilliant thing. And I just had an epiphany about my dad. Go on, here's more no, of your epiphany that you're you, still trying you to impress. Piffed. I can't. I can only do one piff. Otherwise, now come that's on, do very, a load of them. Do that, a series of epiphanies. That's exactly what goes wrong. Multiple with Multiple epiphanies. Is we it, can do them all day long in here. <laughs> he gave me mul- multiple epiphanies. Barely even moved off the chair, and the epiphanies no, were flowing she like they wine. They had to carry her on the train. <laughs> She could never walk again. You won't make Eastbourne at this rate, Wax. <laughs> She's piffed. The woman is piffed. Permanently. Um, so, right, so you think that there is, a, obviously there is an aspect of your own psychology, even in your sort of 
enlightened and well, modern. You're right. The, 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 the father in all of us motivated me to seek. But it means it's a very thin slice. You know, the mechanics are the thin slice. The bigger consciousness is the real McCoy. I Obviously, it was t- it's Buddhism. That's the real McCoy. I find it difficult to talk about, even though I studied it at Oxford. But these guys opened consciousness. You're right. They didn't define it because it doesn't have, you know, I think Einstein said, if we're not conscious, how do we define consciousness? Mm. You know, they didn't define it, but they experienced it. These guys open up where it's timeless. You know, these are the 10,000 hour guys. It's timeless. There's no, um, you know, they, they do tests on these monks the whole time, you know, doing the, uh, there's a blink test where most of us would, our amygdala would sound, you know, because they show really disturbing pictures. But these guys, their amygdala, it's more complicated than that. But they're not, they, their cortisol doesn't rush like wow. that. Wow. It's you know, actually so working. It worked. It happened to be that. It could have been people who um, were astrologists. It could have been uh, Scientologists. It happened to be Buddhism. Well, you say that it happened to be. But they would say, no, we it had was, this technology passed down from the Buddha who had a No, I'm saying it in- is a Westerner. You know, I'm saying they knew. Yeah. It's just who the, who, you know, with our arrogance, we think, well, the, the fat guy was sitting there. What was he doing? And meanwhile, they knew everything. Yes. And, and so what fascinates me is what else they know and what else they would teach us if we follow this down. Down. It's not going to just be... Why do you think I live with a monk? Do you live with a monk? Well, he lives in my house, but but his job is mean? he works for Google, and he works for Facebook, and he works for banks, and they all long to learn this piece. Mm. You know, and how Who to... Who is this guy, by the way, this monk you're living with? Tukton, he, he's, he's the guy, the monk in the book. Mm. Um, he's in your gaff now. He, What's your husband he doesn't make like, of this? No, we Shipped met... Shipped a bloody I mean, monk in. I shipped a monk in. Is that bad? Well, yes, I think it is. <laughs> You've popped a monk in the spare room. But kids left, right? And there was a, a there was room, and I thought that is so such a great move. Well, I met him; he was doing a conference, and he boy can he he's articulate. He went to Oxford. Is he Western? Yeah, his mother. I know this is weird. Remember the Kumars? Of course. Not Mira, the other lady. This the is older his, one. That's the nan. She's his son. He's Ooh. sure he's the son. Right. So he's that's reassuring. He's, his story is unbelievable, and. Uh, he went. He was uh, an addict, and he went to clean up many years ago at Sammy Ling, and they give a they they give a course, you know, for a year to clean up your act. And he he got so into it, he became the fully ordained monk. And I'm talking, you know, five years of silence. It's mm. they, they don't just pass this card out. And I have to say, his vibe in my house, I call him my air freshener, mm. you know, or the toilet duct. You know what I mean? You can't get a better vibe. Do you meditate with him? Yes, we do. Every day? Yeah. Well, he travels the world. He's in Jamaica now with Google, I think. Because doing tech stuff or doing meditation no, stuff? No, they all long to do, you know, to learn meditation for different companies. They pay him and he, the monk isn't allowed to have money, so he's building retreats. So he's just built one in, um, I think, Southampton, and then he's building another one in Scotland. They're not allowed to make money. So he's, he's making doing them at the extreme ends of the country. He's coming around the coastline building retreats, and he's not allowed to have money. It's curious, isn't it? The not retreats for white people to kind of go and get a, get a massage. This is for you know Buddhists and nuns and things. This no, is no, real McCoy. No, I'm not McCoy. And also, your monks' retreats. No. I'm not critiquing yeah. that. But you know, movie. retreats it's now. A tangent. Have, retreats have that thing. You go to a hotel, and there's a candle and a stone. So they go, oh, it's a retreat. Yes, I know. And now this appropriation of spiritual doctrine and the commodification of it is something that I am kind of aware of. And it's peculiar when sort of great tech monoliths such as Google and Facebook recognize its efficacy and essentially say, how can we commodify this? How can we utilize this for profit? How can we turn it like because you said that, that, you know, that your experience has been that it's increased your compassion and it's compre- uh, and it's uh, increased your presence. Now, look, you like me find yourself in a situation where I presume you still have the drive that you always had because it's part of yeah, it's who... in my DNA. So what do you what are you doing with it? And, like, I mean, obviously you're doing this, but how, how's it working for you with this? You know, how is your ego? How is your mm. sort of self laceration, self flagellation? How is that all going now? Well, it's got the same tone. You know, we don't change skin. It's, you know, I can feel the same qualities. But as I said, it's 
I, I can't think of anything better, and John Kevinson said it. It's more like a radio in another room. Like I can grab it and be Ruby again, and part of me is so addictive. You know, if you show me, I don't know, John Kevinson gave me a really good review last night for the book, Beside You, and he's my, that's my, he invented mindfulness. Right. So my next thing was to write John and say, do you think I could come over and do my show for you? I mean, he's just uh, the ambition. You want. I can feel it. You know, it's, it's, an, it's like a, an animal. It's, it's the, you know, when I see the alien, I go, hey, buddy, I know exactly how you feel. But it's not wild ambition that I, that made my career with no talent. I would not have You keep have saying no. that, and I don't think it's entirely... I developed right. talent, but it, in the beginning, I wouldn't take no for an answer. Yeah, I just showed up on TV. It? They said, but you can't have a TV show. I said, I'm showing up. I'm I'll here. Turn on the cameras. They said, well, who the hell are you? I said, I'm here. I've arrived. What about, so do you think this is something that oh, can we've be... we've gone off a really interesting, you said something interesting, and I went off. No, that was, that's right. okay, I'm happy with the tangents. Do you oh, think so that that could be described uh, and diagnosed <laughs> neurologically, or do you think there's another component to that, this drive, this willingness, this ongoing desire? Well, it's dopamine. It's the same thing that gets people fixed. I'm fixed on approval, fixed on rage, fixed on, you know, I, I now but from doing Who Do You Think You Are, I, I get it. My dad got out of their country two seconds before he would have been annihilated, but he never shut it off. When he got to Chicago, he ate his way through. He lived in rage. He became the tyrant he escaped from. And that's how Ooh. I've lived. I will eat you alive if you get in my way. And now it's just, it almost destroyed, you know, my family, whatever, you know, because I, I wasn't around when my kids were young. And now because of, of watching the mind, just watching it and going, okay, Ruby, but without whipping myself, because, you know, if you hit the animal, it gets more violent. I go, calm down, calm down. Let's use that anger when we need it. I, this isn't perfect. This is my ideal. Yeah, go on. And then when, you know, when, when the man hasn't come to fix your fridge and it's been a year, use that anger. Well, Ruby, go on the phone and do what you do. But then when you put the phone down, then don't go call somebody up and go, you know what I did? Because that son of a bitch didn't show up. And I do some of this. Don't get off on it. Get all, and then I'm, I've got it. I'm the, and then I start picking other things to make me angry because I want more, just like a junkie. Yeah. So kind of understanding that, I will give somebody hell, and it's so tempting because it does taste more delicious than being nice. WB Yates said every artist must create his own religion, and you are creating your own religion sourced as it necessarily seems to be in your case from a secular understanding of modern scientific ideas and it is working for you you're like telling us some of your codes some of your methods for coping with your personal human condition so now you're saying that some of that source material the drive is being repurposed effectively and have your relationships for example with your husband and your three children are they those relationships are improving well, they are improving, but then my kids are, my two daughters are in comedy now, and the engine's starting to whir, you know, of me, and I'm becoming Ethel Merman to push them, and they go back off. And I feel, the, but eventually I do have to back off because it's your kids. I can't devour them the way my dad devoured me. This time I'm backing off. He ate me alive. And, you know, we he died and we were not friends. What do you mean he ate you alive? He just... Uh, he overwhelmed me. You know, they wanted to mold me like a piece of, you know, clay. They mm. wanted a rep. They wanted a photocopy, and I wasn't it. So they kicked the shit out of me. What were you meant to be? I was meant to be. Uh, I don't know. You know, like my mother was perfect. She spoke eight languages. She married a tyrant. Really bad move. Uh, just a nice Jewish person, I guess. Not interesting. Academic or successful. They wanted me to get something outside of a D because I was a I. I got really, I, I didn't get any grades. They were below the toilet because I was, now I know I was traumatized. I couldn't think. They'd say, what books did you read? And I'd go, um, I couldn't. So I was put in the remedial class and my brain was frozen. Mm. And I thought it was because I was dumb. You were traumatized by your father. Well, they were wild. Both of them. I wrote a book way earlier called How Do You Want Me? Yeah, How Do You mm. Want Me? And Carrie Fisher edited it. And she said, my parents were as crazy as hers. There's nothing else to say. Because hers mm. are the A-list. Mm. And the, my parents were as dark as it comes. As dark as it comes. And, do, and by that, you like, and this isn't to be diminishing, you mean sort of ordinary domestic darkness, as in there's not, not talking sexual abuse, we're not no, talking violence. No, don't really allow to do sex. Oh, but there's violence. And there's, and there's psychological torture. 
Go on. No, no. Psych- I mean, Ed is a nice man who I married. He said when he sees my parents, he wants to take their head and jam it, jam it <laughs> to the side of a table because of the cruelty. But in a Philip Larkin type way, they are responding to sort of massive social trauma and political trauma. Now I know. I didn't know where they came from. You know, they didn't tell me about the Holocaust. It was never mentioned. So they passed it to me. So I had noises of this. I never watched a film about Nazis because since I was a kid, I heard screaming in my head. And that's because they gently sublimated it and passed that noise. You think that, that, well, that, I mean, that's not genetic, is it? That's some sort of morphic psychological yeah. transference. Then I, I put my hands up. I don't know. Torture. Curious. Yeah, the mystery remains. Know. Like uh, at the beginning of uh, psychoanalysis, you know, a, a separate from neurology, there's these sort of distinct schools. Freud, you know, to, to praise you dreadfully, believing that, that psyche is built upon repression and primarily repressed sexuality. And Jung, who maintained that there was, that there was a mystery and a, 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 a collective unconscious and a, 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 tr- a transcendent aspect to who we are in self, wasn't super he mechanical. A, wasn't he on the button too? I'm into that dude. Me so, too. so, so you love Jung. So that because for me, a lot of like in the like I love this Melville quote. I hit it up a lot. Uh, All human sciences but passing fables, meaning mm. that eventually yeah. you'll look at that and go, oh, how cute, quantum theory. You know, like, yeah, you know, yeah. so, so like, w- w- what in the work of Jung do you find fascinating from your perspective of someone who understands neurology in the way that you do? No, I, but let me say the answer to everything isn't mechanics. It's just I hold on to it. Right. right? I, that's my problem. I see. Okay. Yeah, it's not. Cool. It's, it, you know, you, it's, I'm not a reductionist but it's me showing off you know yes, if i yes. just went, oh. russell i really like meditation because it makes me much prettier and um and i sit and i sit in front of my buddha and i like things and you really like me then but i think hey throw that amygdala it's like me tossing my dick out well yeah, it was a very nice it. dick it was all smothered in amygdala <laughs> juice <laughs> But so, like, so what do you like about Jung? Do you like the sort of archetypes? No, I love, uh, you know, the, what, what, tell me the something shadow, about it. The shadow, the mm. shadow was so interesting, of course, because, you know, um, Freud wanted to be a neurologist, but you couldn't find a live brain, you know, so he was guessing. There is no id. There is no, you know. There, yeah, these there are, are just metaphors and they're symbols. They're metaphors. And he was kind of spot on too, but he went too literal. Mm. Whereas there is something, you know, that isn't mechanical, that isn't neuroscience, of something that we're, that lives below us, something lurks. I Maybe it's my addiction, maybe it's the rage, but it's something that when the mind does meet it, the light shines on the darkness. There is a kind of peace, and that is mindfulness too. It's the dark meeting the light. You know, it's the, it's the, it's the anima and the animus. There's a marriage. Um, and so rather than fighting yourself with those abusive thoughts, which I, I accept because if you get angry at those thoughts... This is a more mundane quote, but if you run from the monster, it chases you. And if you face it, it runs from you. So there's a marriage. And he was very much about, you know, the male and the female side, the dark and the light. And that's as far as I can take it. He was right on the button. I mean, if that's not stealing from Buddhism and he was into mandalas Mm. and of course, archetypes is completely correct. We aren't one thing. I'm not just Ruby, who's like at this age. And I don't feel female. I really don't. If you woke me up at four in the morning and said, what sex are you? I'd really have to say, I don't know. Yes. Because I don't feel it. And we should understand we're not a stereotype. This body is, a, is like a, always a cesspool of genes and experience. And I could pull a card at any time. You know, I'm living proof. I was a moron at a, as a kid and then end up in Oxford. Who the fuck would have thought that one? It's just if you let it go and you really study because it ain't coming to you, Mm. that brain has got its neuroplastic. You can really develop this brain. It's going to be harder when you're older. But if I start learning Chinese and I start, you know, whatever, Mm. I will have the wiring that a 30 year old doesn't have. I suspect that a lot of people listening to this will suffer from mental health issues because, you know, I attract them and obviously you do. They're my people. So people can change. They can change, but let me just say, with the disease, you know, again, we don't know about this. If you have cancer, you can't think your way out of it. Do, do you understand? Uh, do mental illness, way. well, you don't get the fear. You can mm. lower the fear. You can, with depression, you lower the shame, which means that when I feel the little nips of the depression coming, I, because I have a little bit you of an respond. overview, I know what to do. I don't get busier, which is usually my way to go. I'm perfectly Mm. fine. I'll show up at your uh, 
I showed up at a charity for Save the Puffin, like I give a shit, last time. And I took up scuba diving at Christmas under Brighton Pier to show everybody I was. And then you end up in an institution for five months or you take on a lot of work to get the cortisol, which is the very thing that's making the depression about depression. About So this time I see it coming. I shut everything down because I respect that disease. I checked into a little retreat, no TV, and I just sat and bit the bullet. It hurts like fuck, but it passed faster because the cortisol was down, and that's why Kabat-Zinn worked with people in pain. Focus on the pain because if you don't, your whole body is the essence of pain. Focus in on where it is, okay? I'm not completely depressed, but there is depression. Mm. So that doesn't mean I still take medication, Mm. but I have a different relationship with it. Gosh, that's really fascinating and really, really helpful. And what I'm enjoying very much about this conversation is the evident marriage between spirituality and science. I feel that this is going to play an important part in our conversation. I mean, you and I, but I mean culturally going forward because my sense is... And it's one of the things we've been looking at continually over the course of these podcasts that, uh, you know, Adam Curtis, it was that said, uh, oh the, my God. the old thing is dead and the new thing has not yet been born. And like we're this age of managerial politics, this age of bogus institutionalized religion, all these things sort of coming to a halt and people are looking for ways to connect with their essence, ways to understand their story. But it's got to have the right language. It's got to feel real. Mm-hmm. People can't pose through it but i sense that there's much in this stuff that we've talked about uh, around jungian archetypes uh, uh, because mostly because we need a way to access the mystery and by the mystery i don't mean a woo thing i mean there is a terrain that can never be contained by our uh, uh, limited capacity for knowledge but that's why i mean i i might be pulling this out you know and we weren't going in this direction is this all comes down to f- it, our our working to, as a tribe it all went wrong when we, when we suddenly went agricultural and we lost each other. And I think in this world, we're too isolated. Yes. And I have, these, I have these things called Frazzle Cafes where groups yeah, of people... Yeah, tell us make, about those. They're interesting. Well, I, I didn't mean to swerve. I just no, it's meant, good. It's good. I always... Uh, the real cure, the real thing for compassion, this is the road is, is that we start to be human again with each other. You know, meeting in smaller groups maybe and not doing cocktail bullshit where you have to say, how's your kid? Like, I give a shit. You know, life is hard enough. When you talk to people, it's completely superficial. So anyway, from my experience in the theater, I set up these groups. If you go to frazzlecafe.org, put down your name, we get in touch with you. Marks and Spencer's gave me all their cafes. They shut it down, and then groups of 15 meet every two weeks with a facilitator. And all these people, it breaks your heart. It's so touching. They're scared in the beginning, like little frail humans, and they're all ages, all mm. colors, all, you know. And suddenly... They start to speak human to say they're not mentally ill. They're like all of us. You know, they open their hearts. And by the time you leave, they're all holding hands. They've exchanged phone numbers. And they've some groups have been going for a year. They have their tribe. And I know that that's part of all this is that we're so alone and nobody's comparing notes. Yes, I like that idea. I think you're qu- quite right about like sort of uh, Yuval Noah Harari. Come on here and just talk to us through the sort of one of the driving ideas in his book *Sapiens* is how the advent of agriculture, which is obviously an economically led notion, yeah. meant a huge uh, well, not a diaspora. It meant a sort of people urbanizing coming together and people becoming sort of units in an economy as opposed to and, and losing a certain necessary essential connection uh, that you know like that like he explains in that book agriculture works for uh, one strata of society but it doesn't work for the bump majority now bump it up bump it up bump it up and technology works for so many things just like they we needed to go into the architectural stage yes. but We've our our brain is still caveman. We don't know yes. how to adjust to this population. But this techno this uh, this notion of teleological continued progress is underwritten by the same idea 
as agriculture. We are progressing. We are going forward. And I would say that that requires a mechanistic and materialistic Weltanschauung <laughs> to continue. And until you say, no, 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 there is a mystery. All the things that we access through the senses are by necessity limited. And unless we find a route back to who we are, who we are as humans, mm. of which like something is uh, like, you know, I, I have in my own life a collectivized support group and community groups where we do talk to one another in very open, honest, plain ways. Boy, are you lucky. Yeah, it's like yeah. the gift of, uh, of addiction in my case. But I think, you know, but there's nothing to stop us creating societies based on a different model, creating groups on a different model of saying, well, we need not only commune under economic circumstances. It's only like struck me recently how ridiculous that kids socialise in shopping malls. That's where they go. If you're not spending money, you're not congregating, you're not coming together. So we can ransack and attack religious institutions all we like and go knows how corrupt they became but it was a place where people went together to do something exactly. other than buy something exactly when uh, it's the same thing if when we had churches and you know a gathering again we didn't need extraneous uh, methods or a mental fitbit that was you know a community w- was being human it's yes. a, it's a group that's human not an individual an individual alone is like a finger so um it's the loneliness and and you know the being open to saying I'm fucked I don't I need to be contacting people and saying here's what's going on in my mind is that what's Mm. going on in yours and there will be such relief when that happens what do you think of this thing that Yanis Varoufakis said when he were in here he goes the individual we exist in like he's a sort of a person that don't like he said that he thinks matter came before spirit so I disagree with him I don't even know what he's talking about well that consciousness (laughs) must have come from matter rather than matter coming from consciousness but he said that you that we exist in dialectic that we exist in relationship but without each other you know what is self if there aren't other people to relate to so our whole notion of what it is to be an individual is is wrong so what do you what in your work it's um, wrong I mean you know the mother builds the child's brain through her reaction, the, a, a kid is just a blob of fat unless the mother starts, which was my case. Um, she me tried too. to keep me a blob of fat and then dressed me and gave me these hideous haircuts. And I was sent to school as a blob of fat. Wow. Yeah. So, but they, they, the only way a human being is molded is through the, the compassion and the emotion of the mother. She teaches the kid what it is to be human. So we te- I love this expression, we work like neural Wi-Fi. If I was in a aroused state, I'd pass it straight to you. Mm. So we infect each other, but we yes. could infect each other, yes. maybe Positively. with things like mindfulness. I can only teach you compassion and give you compassion. Now, I can't do it alone, but yes. if, my, if the certain... And there are chemicals involved that uh-huh. oxytocin switches oh, yes. on. Chemicals, chemicals, all very well, good. I like a nice bit of mumbo jumbo well, of a morning, a good yeah. chant and a good robe and a good bald but geezer. But even when you get that sexy thing, that's a chemical. I'm sorry to say there's no consciousness involved. Something goes, a little bit of juice goes to the penile area. I'm not talking about little... sex, Ruby. You did I... that all in your own mind. I like to no, like, mumbo saying... jumbo means uh, rhubarb, a hullabaloo. Oh, no, not, no, that not I know. monkey business. I meant monkey business. I you know. Were you did no but i'm saying compassion is could be reduced to, to a, a juice, chemical and and we do talk about in relationships like but these why compositions we're in the 20s. of chemicals where do they come oh, from and what holds them together what invisible grid? anyway look see i'm not as smart as you that's oh, the problem I, that's a, uh, finally we agree on <laughs> broken my pencil in egotistical um indulgence hey Glee. ruby Ruby, um, what do I want to say? I like that thing you were just ending on about like that we find it difficult to individuate because like when something happens around me and my parents, like I can't see it objectively because they are enmeshed in the self that is witnessing it. So um, mm. thank you very much for that. You've got to go because literally I'm wrapping this up not because I want to but because is my uh, train Gareth, really who leaving? produces it, says you've got to get a train in 25 minutes to go to Eastbourne. For, well, I can't imagine why. I'm spreading the joy. <laughs> well, they need it. No, in I love I love doing these shows. I love it. They're fantastic. I love the show. I saw your. Is it is it the show that I yeah. came and saw yeah, you yeah. doing? Well, to me, it's so, a mating of mind and ego. The perfect marriage. Perfect marriage. Finally. Yeah. Yeah. Who comes first? Um, Ruby is a, a ma- usually the ego, surely selfish, the mind, but then the mind is sort of all encompassing. Ruby, thank you for coming on here. Thank you. For, uh, your, let me plug your book properly. Uh, Ruby's new book, How to Be Human. The manual is released in January, and there's a very good, at least one good quote but on the can front of it. Get. 
Yeah. You could pre-order it now on Amazon. Oh, yeah, pre-order it because pre-orders is good for people. So yeah. pre-order it now. Yeah. Uh, Ruby, thank you for thank coming you. on here. What a joy to talk to you. Thank you for giving us so much time. I hope time. I looked good. You're beautiful. On the it's podcast. On I, oh, oh, I didn't, fuck, I didn't hold in my stomach. Yeah, I'm, uh, you'll be beautifully unselfconscious. <laughs> Ruby, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. This show that you've just listened to then, using your ears, was sponsored by my new book, Recovery, which you can get as an audio book on Audible. It's brilliant. Or you can get it on Amazon, which is very good. And you can come and see me on my rebirth tour. Like you've listened to me, come and look at me. Leicester, 13th of November. It's rearranged gigs. There's new tickets come available. You're going to love it. Torquay, 25th of November. Imagine seeing me in Torquay. Imagine what's going to resonate in the air down there. Portsmouth, 28th of November. Fantastic. What a night to be alive. Reading on the 29th of November, which I believe is Churchill's birthday. Ah! Go to www.russellbrand.com to get your ticket. Finally, if you like this show, subscribe to it, review it in iTunes. Don't give it any less than six, star, no, five stars. You can't do six stars, can you? But surely the day will come. Well, thanks for listening. We love you, and uh, we'll see you again soon. Bye bye.